That is our basic text for this morning. We are in week number 28 of our material. If you don't have material, uh, it is not a, um, a big deal as long as you have your Bible open. If you're visiting with us, we're in John chapter 7. We are walking through the Gospels in uh, 2010. And for quite a while, we have been predominantly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We return to the Gospel of John, chapter 7 this morning, and we'll have a little bit more to say about that here in just a few moments. We're in week 28 of our material. I would tell you uh, we have our new reading calendars for the month of August on the visitor's table in the foyer. They will also be passed out uh, as you leave this morning. Please be sure to get a copy of that. That shows you where we're headed in the month with our sermons, but also gives us daily Bible reading to prepare each week for our time together on Sunday mornings. We're glad you're here, and let's begin with a word of prayer, if you'll bow with me. Our great and awesome Heavenly Father, we are so thrilled to be able to address you as our Father this morning. Help us to tune our hearts this morning to sing your praise and to express our thanksgiving and our great need for you throughout this day. Thank you for all of the many physical blessings and luxuries that we enjoy, and we especially thank you for the spiritual blessings that we enjoy in Christ Jesus. Thank you for this gift of prayer. Thank you for the great gift of your word, for its revelation and and for preserving it and making it so freely available to us. And we pray that you would be with us and with our hearts as we open it up this morning. Help us to see and hear with eyes and ears of faith the great words of your Son. Help us to study carefully how he talked and how he lived so that we might learn all the more what it means to be of Christ. Help us as we do our best to live as faithful representatives of His, as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Help us to use our time throughout the day as a time of refreshment and recharging so that we might go out into the world knowing that we are subjects of the great King of Kings. Do our best to teach, to model, to help people understand what it means to be disciples and to teach them and encourage each other in all of the things that Jesus has taught us. Thank you for this opportunity, and it is through Him that we offer our prayer. Amen. Okay, keep your hand there in John chapter 7. Our marker will return there in just a few moments as our basic text... First of all, turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 55. There are lots of passages that we could go back to. If you've got a Bible with cross references, when we read some of the references of Jesus in John chapter 7, you're going to see lots of cross references. And and if you haven't taken the time to go back and see some of those, I would encourage you to take that time. Look at those cross references that deepen our understanding of why Jesus was saying some of the things he did in John 7 and some of the Old Testament echoes, if we're familiar with them, that come across. We want to look at just one. In Isaiah chapter 55, a a statement that would have been very precious to the inhabitants of Jerusalem who were familiar with these Old Testament scriptures. In the context, this is a dark and difficult time. In Isaiah 55, this is a time of captivity. This is a time of the Lord's discipline where God has very, very harsh things to say to His people through Isaiah, trying to get their attention. But here's one glimmer of hope. In Isaiah 55 and verse 1, He says, Come, everyone who thirsts, 
Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. It continues on, obviously. But I want you to imagine being a first century A.D., inhabitant of Jerusalem or someone who has traveled to Jerusalem for this great feast that we're going to read about in John 7 and you're familiar with those words and every time that you've read them you're always thinking that's to come that's to come that's down the line maybe just maybe I'll see the fulfillment of Isaiah 55 in my own time We're going to go back to John 7 and read in just a moment one other passage if you open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. The setting of John chapter 7 is in Jerusalem. Okay, We have been with Jesus obviously for a long time in the region of Galilee. And we're going to read John's commentary as to why Jesus has stayed in that area. We're going to follow Jesus from Galilee down to Jerusalem in just a moment. And we're going to read about this Feast of Booths. Now, to you and I, that that doesn't mean a whole lot. But to these people, it meant a great deal. You just look at the basic headings in uh, Leviticus chapter 23, where God begins through Moses talking to his people about very specific observances throughout the year. Uh, The the Sabbath in verse 3. How often did the Sabbath come around? Once a week, right? Every seventh day had roots not just in the Ten Commandments, but all the way back in creation. The Passover beginning in verse 4, once a year, that commemorated for the Jew what? What did the Passover remind them of? They're in Egypt, right? As they're in captivity and uh, before they get to the Red Sea. Of course, there's, there's the crossing of the Red Sea, but specifically that one night in Egypt when the angel of the Lord would pass over those houses that had the blood on the, the lintel and, and the doorposts. He's going about killing every firstborn in Egypt. And as long as they had that blood, the angel of the Lord would pass over their house. And there are other things beginning in verse 9, the feast of first fruits. Beginning in verse 15, the feast of weeks. Verse 23, the feast of trumpets. Verse 26, the day of atonement where once a year a lamb would be slain and, and another would be sent out into the wilderness. This was the way God reminded people every year of the seriousness of their sins over the course of the last 300 plus days. Beginning in verse 33, we've got the Feast of Booths. Okay? And he, he's got quite a bit of ex, uh, explanation. Down in verse 39, on the 15th day of the seventh month, once a year, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, this would be in the fall of the year, the time of the harvest, you shall celebrate the Feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God." 
Once a year at harvest time in the fall of the year, you get out of your houses and you dwell outside in booths to remind yourselves that as you were around Mount Sinai and throughout the wilderness, you dwelt in very temporary dwelling places. From God's point of view, what is He trying to get these people to remember, do you think? I mean, here they are, in, even in the days of Jesus, and those people in Jerusalem have very nice houses, many of them. Even the, the lowliest of the low who had housing, it wasn't just booths, stone houses. And so why, once a year, is it not just a, a, a nice camping trip, but it's a command. You get out of your house and for an entire week you dwell in a booth. Dave, go ahead. Well, I mean, these were temporary dwelling places. I mean, okay. nothing was permanent. Okay. You know, just a reminder of yeah. the temporary nature of, of their life and, and you know, God's law that they received is enduring. And yeah. That's the last prayer. Even the stone houses that you have are just temporary. Sometimes we lose sight of that, right? Paul, you had your hand raised? Uh, pretty much the same thing. I just, you know, life itself is temporary okay. here on earth, but they want them to realize the spiritual aspect, which will dwell for an eternity. Yeah. And who, whether you're dwelling in booths or a nice stone house in downtown Jerusalem, who is the one who owns all of that? That's God, right? A lesson He tried to get these people to remember. And even today in that part of the world, you see this feast observed where people will go outside of their houses. You see here a a narrow city street in downtown Jerusalem. Houses up here and then little booths. You see the, the kinds of boughs or trees or branches that God was talking about and how even today this is the western or the Wailing Wall, as close to the Temple Mount as uh, native Jews are able to get because it is not in their control. And so they'll get as close as they can get and observe that. You see, even (laughs) people who live in, in apartment complexes, you see where their booths are for the week. Out on their out on their decks, okay. So uh, observed in a variety of different ways in modern day Israel, but this is what we're talking about, okay. This is our setting. We go back to John chapter seven, okay. Let's go back to our setting. This is what is being observed in John chapter seven, beginning in the first verse of the chapter. It has been now, you you look just before this, back in John chapter 5, you remember where Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath day at the pool of Bethesda, right there in Jerusalem. Just two chapters before John 7, it's been about a year since Jesus had this major confrontation. We've spent the bulk of our time in Matthew, Mark, and Luke We're now historically just about six months before the crucifixion of Jesus, okay? This is his third trip to Jerusalem, his last trip where he will go and then choose to leave on his own. So about two and a half years worth of teaching and walking about that that we have covered, we're about six months away from his death. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Even in John 5, that had come out loud and clear. He heals a man on the Sabbath. There's this big confrontation. And that's just one of several different reasons that the Jewish authorities are intent on killing him. Now, the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here, leave Galilee, and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers believed in him. Now, we know that eventually they will. What does it take for James, for instance? What does it take for him to finally believe that Jesus is who he says he is? It takes his resurrection from the dead, right? 
After his death and burial and resurrection, we find James and Mary and, and other siblings there on the day of Pentecost in, in that upper room. But right now, even his own brothers don't believe him. And so if you are really who you claim to be, and if this is about gaining a following, why hang out in Podunk, Galilee. Why not go down and show everybody, especially this is one of those times when people from all over will gather in Jerusalem. And uh, people who are, are wanting to be known, this is the kind of opportunity that they always look for. Jesus in verse 6 says, my time has not yet come. It's not the first time that we've run across that. Back in John 2, when Jesus talked with his mother, she encourages him to perform a miracle. And he asks, what does this have to do with me? My, my hour, my time has not yet come. When Jesus gives those kinds of responses, my time has not yet come, what time does he have in mind? Alan? Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, he knows how he's going to be glorified, right? These people haven't wrapped their minds around that. They have the idea, triumphantly coming into Jerusalem, miraculously kicking the Romans out, reestablishing the physical throne of David, sitting right here in the heart of Judaism, and feeding people for the, the, the rest of their lives, the kind of things they have in mind, right? That, that's come through loud and clear in what we've studied. Whereas Jesus, on more than one occasion, has said... We're going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to be raised again. That is how the Son of God is going to be glorified. And even on this trip to Jerusalem, has that time come? No. And Jesus knows that. His betrayal and arrest is not going to somehow sneak up on Him. Okay, He knows that that time has not come. What happens if Jesus leads a mighty thronging parade all the way from Galilee down to Jerusalem? Well, then we've got a triumphal entrance, right? Like we read later in the Gospels, but not yet. That time has not yet come. He says in verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast. Some of our English translations say, I am not yet going up to this feast, for my hour has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. They have in mind this big, dramatic parade that goes all the way down to Jerusalem and just makes this enormous splash right at the beginning of this feast. Take the opportunity. It's the kind of opportunity that Satan tempted Jesus with when he put him right there on the pinnacle, on the edge of the temple and said, you just throw yourself down and the angels of the Lord won't allow you to dash your foot against a stone. And just imagine what all of these people will think about that. So far, Jesus has kept all of those extreme expectations at bay, right? People in Galilee come along and try and force him to be king, and he disappears from their midst and passes through the, the, the midst of them. People are thronging around him, and, and he'll teach them from a boat, and then he'll leave and go to the other side of the sea. Over and over again, we see him pushing people back. Why? Why does he continue to do that, Paul? Well, my feeling on that is that Christ himself was not looking for something big and, and accentual in the beginning. Uh -huh. He was wanting to focus on, everybody to focus on his death, burial, and resurrection, mm -hmm. not on his entry into a city and yeah. pomp and, and all that. And not, not the physical but the spiritual, right, has come through loud and clear over and over and over again. People are just struggling with 
processing that. They still very much have a, a physical thing in mind. Just last week we were with his closest 12 and, and they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest when he finally sat on his throne, right? We're still very, very, very much struggling with that whole concept. And so, not yet. Verse 10, but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up. Not publicly, but in private, okay? This is what modern day Jerusalem, of course, looks like. The, uh, the Mount of Olives is what, uh, this picture is taken from. Way down here and off to the right is the, uh, what is believed to be the Garden of Gethsemane. This would have been, as best we can tell, the pinnacle of the temple. The temple would have stood here. That's what it looks like today. That's what it would have looked like. Something like like that 2,000 years ago. Okay, we've got the large temple complex, Solomon's porch, where eventually in Acts, uh, saints gather uh, in Jerusalem and, and pray together and worship together, and there's a great deal of teaching done there. The physical temple, the area, the Antonia fortress, where Jesus will eventually be taken and... Uh, uh, severely beaten by Roman soldiers and appear before Pilate, so on and so forth, okay? We zoom in to the temple complex, the, the temple building itself. Here's our setting, verse 11. The Jews were looking for him at the feast. It's very evident that there's a buzz about this man. He's done enough for that. And saying, where is he? There was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he is leading the people astray. You've got some saying he's either Elijah or the great prophet. It maybe, just maybe he's the Messiah. You've got a number of Jewish authorities saying he's able to do amazing things, but he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the, the prince of demons. For fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, middle of this seven-day great feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? He didn't come here and, and sit among the rabbis, okay? He didn't take the same path as, as Saul of Tarsus did for the first several decades of his life. And so Jesus answers, My teaching is not mine but His who sent me. A way of saying what you're hearing is from God, right? I'm not just expounding on or reading to you from the scroll of Isaiah. You're familiar with that. I'm teaching you and what I'm teaching you is from God. And then he lays down the gauntlet in verse 17. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority, if I've just come along and, and I've been raising this ruckus up in Galilee and now I've come down and I'm just spouting off things that come from me and me alone, well then I'm seeking my own glory. And that's what his brothers had in mind, right? Right? But the one who seeks the glory of Him who sent Him is true. And in Him there is no falsehood. It's like we on Sunday evenings we've been walking with Elijah, right? And as Elijah stands before the king of Israel, King Ahab, Elijah unashamedly says, These are the words of God. Was Elijah seeking his own glory? I mean, obviously not. At the Lord's bidding, he'd go out into the wilderness and, and stay for months. And yet it could not be denied there were powerful things behind the words and the deeds of Elijah. He's not just speaking on his own authority. What he's saying is true because it's not from Elijah, it's from God. 
verse 19, as Jesus applies this kind of thing to himself, has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? You know, your, your average feast goer here in Jerusalem doesn't know the inner workings of the minds of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They can't read those men's minds. But Jesus can, right? And so far, it's been very tightly guarded. If when we have the opportunity, we don't want to get the people turned around and so not only are we trying to to hold on to our standing and and not trample too much on public opinion but we've got to get rid of Jesus and the masses don't really know that yet but Jesus does and so he answers in verse 21 I did one work John chapter 5 seems to be what he has in mind healing that man at the pool of Bethesda on uh, on the Sabbath day I did one work and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, God's law says on the eighth day that baby is to be circumcised regardless of the day that it's on. And if that's the case, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ or the Messiah appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from. But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true and him you do not know. I know him for I come from him and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John's way of saying, regardless of what these people are going to try to do, try to scheme, Jesus is not going to be betrayed, arrested, beaten, crucified, and buried until God says it's time. This is all a part of of God's plan. Many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than, than this man has done? But here in verse 32, you've got the Pharisees. They hear the crowd muttering these things about him and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer. We know it's about six months. And then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. And so they say, well, where where does this man intend to go that he will not find? We will not find him. Does he intend to go to the dispersion across the the, the Galilee or or across the Jordan up north and and beyond where Jews have been dispersed among the the Gentile Greek world? Is, Is that where he's going to go? What does he mean by saying you will see? Seek me and you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. And here's our climactic moment in verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, the the grand finale of this feast of booths, Jesus stood up and cried out. Now you remember what we read in Isaiah 55. Okay? And here's, here's why we went back and read that. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus 
had not yet been glorified. There's a process here, but Jesus stands up right in the middle of the grand finale and says, you've heard about living water. You remember what Isaiah and God's other prophets said about drinking and never thirsting and about times of refreshment and times of restoration and the great one who was to come. You know, Isaiah 55 comes right after Isaiah 53 and 54. That makes sense, doesn't it? But but in Isaiah 53, you know, the, that language about the suffering servant who would come and and bear the sins of an entire nation. And then Isaiah 55, whoever thirsts, let him come. Stop spending uh, your money and resources on things that don't satisfy. Same kind of thing he said to that Samaritan woman in John 4, right? Whoever drinks of this water will never thirst again. What sort of reaction is he going to get if he stands up right in the middle of this throng on the grand finale of what Josephus, the Jewish historian, describes as the greatest and holiest feast of the Jews? What's going to happen? He's. What'd you say? Okay, I, he's going to draw a lot of attention for sure. And what is he saying? In saying those things, what's his claim? David, I am the Christ. Yeah. The one that was told about in the Old Testament. Yeah. I'm the one you've been waiting on. Now, so far, of, of course, it, it has been just little bits and pieces, but here is another rather significant chunk where he stands up and he... he basically echoes what one of the great revered Old Testament prophets had had said, had written, and he says, you come to me and drink if you're thirsty. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Physical or spiritual refreshment? Of course, spiritual. We don't have the idea of Jesus holding up a big bucket and inviting people to come and and drink from it and then walking away and never thirsting again. But what he is saying is, here you are in the very center of everything you've always known religiously. Here is the temple. And here are the priests, and here is the sacrificial system, and here's the law. But he's just reminded them, not one of them, is in good standing before God because of perfect law keeping and you're thirsty you're under Roman oppression and right over there you can see the the Roman Antonia Fortress and all around you can see Roman soldiers and all around you see death and tears and disease but there's something greater available If these people are to come to him and drink, what are they going to have to do? Going to have to listen to what he says, right? I mean, that's how you drink deeply from what Jesus is talking about. You hear and are moved and respond and live for him. Okay? And of course, we'll talk more about his glorification uh, as we move along. Verse 40, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet, the one uh, Moses had told us about all the way back in Deuteronomy. Others said, this is the Christ, the Messiah, the Deliverer. Some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem? You know, right down the road from Jerusalem. And of course, we know how God engineered that fulfillment. Verse 43, So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers that had been dispatched by the authorities, they come back and the question is, why Why do you not bring him? And the answer, no one ever spoke like this man. 
This is not historically the first or the last person that comes into Jerusalem and claims to be the Messiah. But these people say, these guards say, no one ever spoke like this man. Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. You know, whatever we can do to get the focus off of ourselves and blame other people, we see that pattern with the Pharisees. Nicodemus is one. Back in John 3, who had spent time with Jesus, one who said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And the response, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Jesus and his teaching forces people to make a choice. We've said that over and over and over again. It is not that Jesus comes and tells people what they want to hear. It is not that Jesus comes and pats people on the back and feeds them and sends them on their way. Jesus makes radical claims rooted in the Old Testament and says, if you're with me, come and drink living water. If not, you're against me. Okay? Lord willing, we will continue week number 29. Like I said, we've got reading calendars that will prepare you for our time in John chapter 8 next Sunday morning. Thank you for being here.